have anything to share, like share screen later, can you please try it right now, one by one? So we're gonna make sure if it's okay. Okay, Sam, could you please try sharing? Perfect, we can see it. Yeah, all good. You need to put it in um, display mode, but otherwise. Yep. Uh, let's see. Yeah, N now, uh, are you it's seeing- still the... not in, It's not in display mode. Um, then... Do you want to try it again quickly? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see if this works. No, that's a no, Word no, document. No. Hmm. Okay. Sam, are you having problems sharing your screen? Yes, I am. Um, but I, I think now I can do it. Otherwise, send me whatever you want to display and we will have the Jakarta team doing that for you. Uh, while we wait anyway, yeah. I don't have anything to display, so that... Uh... No slides from Philippe. Uh, Zoe, do you want to try yours quickly? Well, sure. And then we'll try Sam again. Yeah. Okay. How's that? Yeah, can you put it into display? Yes. Okay. Good. We're all good. So that's perfect. So do you want to get out of there? Thank you. Stop sharing. And Philly, uh, sorry, Sam again. I'm trying. Yep. What do you see now? No, it's a Word document, two Word documents now. It, maybe if you close all of those oh, and just leave the PowerPoint oh, okay. open. Now do you see... Ethical yeah, but you, yeah, and... you're not at the beginning of the... Yeah, yeah that's, that's okay. completely perfect. Yeah. We have for verification, so we Thank are you. going to start with the same link, the same code, just another uh, 15 minutes later. Is that right? No. Okay, Sam, um, can you stop I'm sharing? Ready. And we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, we're ready to go. Okay. Great. Andrea, we're ready to go. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start the countdown right now. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. But the same, the same link, the same link, right? Okay. Okay. So, okay, fine. Thanks. Bye bye. <laughs> Andrew, we, Andrea, we can hear you. So maybe we shouldn't be able to. I'm so sorry. Hola, are you ready for us to go ahead? Yes, we're about to start the countdown. 
Thank you, Andrea. Okay. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the Real Freedom for All Values, Models, Policy and Narrative session. Without any further ado, please welcome our chair, Mrs. Wendy Carlin, to open the session. Mrs. Carlin, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for our, to our hosts in Indonesia. Um, and to the IEA for, uh, for organizing such a, a fantastic um, uh, conference. So this is a rather unusual session uh, for, for an economics conference, but the salience of what we want to talk about today has only be, been sharpened by the experience that we've all had where, wherever we are in the world during, during the pandemic. So just, just as a, 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 an example, we know that many workers have been compelled to work under hazardous conditions, they've lacked both voice and dignity. Um, the climate crisis, lots of other, other problems that we face are really pushing us as economists uh, to think beyond our ideas of, um, uh, of uh, 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 the ideals or the, the norms of shared affluence that we became very familiar with our, um, in the post-war years. And so, you know, this is, this is unusual. This is a, a way to set uh, the scene for our discussion. And I'm really happy to introduce our, our, our panel. We've got Zoe Hitzig here from Harvard, uh, Philippe Van Paris from the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, and Sam Bowles from the Santa Fe Institute. So I've been working with Sam on these questions, as you can see from his title slide. Um, he's going to kick off the discussion and he'll then be followed by Zoe and then Philippe. So each of our panelists has 12 minutes and we're just going to move straight from one to the next, keeping the uh, questions and discussions for uh, after all three um, have uh, given us their thoughts. So over to you, Sam. Thanks very much, Wendy. Um, you can see from the title slide that uh, Wendy and I think we need both philosophy and uh, poetry. That's a book of po poems that uh, Zoe, the economist, has uh, recently published. Let me start with the relationship between um, ethical values and uh, economic models. Uh, policy paradigms, which have been influential, uh, have combined a set of norms of ethical values with a model of how the economy works. And a characteristic of those models is that if the values are pursued, uh, the, the model of the economy will work well. Uh, so there's that kind of compatibility or let's say uh, complementarity between uh, models and values. An example is neoliberalism. There were a set of norms or values, negative freedom, procedural justice, combined with a model in which individual, individualistic and amoral people uh, exchanged goods under complete contracts uh, on competitive markets. And you put those two things together and the economy works well. That is uh, a limited government in that setting uh, is a prescription for a well-working uh, economy according to the model. But there is a hitch. Um, for the paradigm to be successful, the model has to work in the real world so that policies which are being pursued according to the norms and the model will actually make the economy work well enough to deliver concrete benefits to uh, the uh, public. Um, now, uh, previous uh, paradigms of which uh, we have examples here, the neoliberal, the Keynesian social democratic paradigm, classical liberalism, they've eventually failed by the standard as the economy moved on. So that brings us to the task before us. What Wendy and I think we have to do is to design a paradigm which integrates a set of values, egalitarian, democratic, sustainability, with a model of today's economy, uh, uh, one that corresponds to what we actually witness in the economy today. Um, now, uh, just to preview, 
what Wendy and I want to do here is to repurpose some uh, recent developments in economics to outline a, a framework for a well-functioning uh, economy under conditions consonant with values, including a broader conception of freedom, one that goes considerably beyond shared affluence. We think we have a lot to learn from others. Um, for example, the need to integrate philosophy and economics was essential uh, to the, um, the development of the neoliberal paradigm. Um, contributions to economics itself were also part of their success. Uh, Becker's work on interest group, Buchanan on public choice, Hayek on the nature of equilibrium and competition, and so on. These were synergistic with their normative precepts. So for us, a first step towards a new paradigm is that we have to challenge the idea that liberty, fairness, and efficiency are the sole ethical standards for evaluating economic outcomes. Um, now, the, the exclusion of other concerns, we may be concerned about power uh, and its abuse, about dignity and voice. These were excluded from the paradigm, not by fiat, but surprisingly as a result of the Valrhasian model itself. So for example, David Gautier correctly uh, states uh, about a model he, uh, that morality has no application to market interaction under conditions of perfect competition. Uh, he meant perfect competition and complete markets. Uh, now, that may not be surprising coming from a philosopher many people consider to be conservative, but it comes from Kenneth Arrow, uh, who once called himself a socialist as well. Uh, he says, any complaints about the market system's operation can be reduced to complaints about the distribution of income. The price system itself determines the distribution of income only in the sense of preserving the status quo. And so we end up with a situation in which the models themselves are telling us that aside from concerns about distributive justice, Prices can do the work of morals. There is no part in that model for concerns about the exercise of power or dignity or other aspects which we, we may highly value. Now, um, uh, we value uh, these things in their own right, dignity, voice, and so on. But also we think that uh, we, ha and we have to have con conditions which will cultivate these values in part because they will play an essential role in a democratic and egalitarian society. Uh, uh, we include uh, as such things as the absence of domination of one individual over another. Uh, now, um, few economists have worried that the capitalist economy might be antithetical to this enhanced concept of freedom uh, or to the cultivation of values supportive of a free society. Uh, but economic theory itself uh, does supply uh, some reasons uh, to worry. Uh, the most obvious is if we go back to Ronald Coase and his theory of the firm, <clears throat> he represents that relationship as a political one and as an authoritarian one. Listen to him. Coase says, if a workman moves from department Y to department X, he doesn't go because of a change in prices, but because he's ordered to do so. The distinguishing mark of the firm is the suppression of the price mechanism. And the nature of the contract uh, with the worker is that the worker for a certain remuneration agrees to obey the directions of the entrepreneur. Now, um, this, uh, that insight, which I think was widely recognized as being true, uh, nonetheless was, uh, 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 was really peripheral to the development of economics in the last century. Um, the Valrhasian model shielded uh, what Elizabeth Anderson calls the private government of the firm from democratic or even libertarian critique, and it came to dominate economics. Uh, here's Abba Lerner uh, characterizing economics by exactly this assumption. An economic transaction expressed in a contract is a solved political problem. Economics has gained the title queen of the social sciences by choosing solved political problems as its domain. Now, by the way, I think that's a very insightful view of neoclassical economics, but that domain, the domain of complete contracts was never large uh, and it appears to be shrinking as we move into an economy based on care, knowledge, production, distribution, leisure services. These are hard to measure and it's therefore very hard to have a complete contract uh, for workers producing these tasks. 
Uh, now, economics itself has recognized some of the shortcomings of the Valrhasian model and has developed a new set of models, principal agent models of the relationship between uh, employers and workers. Uh, now, <clears throat> let's review four uncontroversial, I think, um, implications of a principal agent model uh, uh, like an efficiency wage model, for example, between workers and uh, employers. Uh, the first is that the principal, who could be a lender or employer, uh, exercises power over the agent. The second uh, is that this power may be abused, uh, sexual harassment, many aggressions, and so on, at no cost to the principal. The third is that because the contract is incomplete, social norms such as a work ethic are essential to sustaining the exchange. And the fourth is the allocations uh, that result, the Nash equilibria of these exchanges are Pareto inefficient. Now this, these four results give us a kind of recipe or uh, a, um, an, uh, tell us some possibilities we could have for challenging the status quo with a broader ethical framework. For example, the unaccountability of power could be addressed through changes in ownership, bargaining, cooperative governance, and so on. Um, the, uh, the abuse of power could be countered by stronger individual rights in the workplace to enhance dignity and equal status. Uh, if we are to sustain the social norms that are essential to exchange, we have to pursue greater equality of reward and of voice. Uh, these are essential um, uh, to mobilizing and cultivating these social norms. And finally, because the allocations are inefficient, there is some room for win-win in, uh, interventions and building coalitions around uh, making the economy work better by making it more consistent with the ethical values that we have suggested. Uh, does this amount to a new paradigm in the making? Well, I, we think uh, it's not there, but we are in the process, I think a great many people are in the process of making one. We've already said a paradigm is based on uh, two parts, uh, ethical foundations and an economic model. We'll add now two more. Uh, a, uh, the, the third is policies that are emblematic of the uh, paradigm itself that suggest its basic values and how it works. And finally, a new economic vernacular, a way that we talk about the economy and convey our concerns. Um, well, obviously, this we, if we have four paradigms here, uh, uh, classical liberalism, uh, and including um, a new paradigm, and four levels or parts of the paradigm, uh, we have a, a, a 16 cells, a four by four table. You can see that Wendy and I have filled it out over here on the right. Uh, but let's just take a particular example, neoliberalism. We've already talked about the first two, the normative foundations and the economic model, but let's add emblematic policies. Uh, school vouchers exactly conveys the idea. It wasn't really an essential part of, uh, of the neoliberal uh, paradigm, but it beautifully expressed the ideas uh, which were central to the paradigm. The new vernacular includes such things as there's no, there's no such thing as society or the government that governs best governs uh, least. Um, what would a new paradigm look like? Well, Wendy and I have to say we don't know, but the reason why we're, we're, we're engaging in these discussions uh, is that we uh, think that together we can uh, put something valuable um, uh, together. Uh, we've already said undominated social relations, equal dignity and voice, uh, sustainability. Uh, the economic models would draw heavily on the, um, uh, uh, new, new ideas from behavioral economics, principal agent models, identity economics. Um, emblematic policies would include essentially uh, wealth redistribution, not only for ethical reasons, but also to support, I mean, not only for redistributive reasons, uh, but also uh, as a part of the project of undominated social relations. Uh, I won't mention the others. Uh, I'm sure we can invent some better vernacular than the ones uh, we have proposed there. Now, when we think about an alternative paradigm, uh, we, we have to go beyond the confines of the policy debate that we see today. The blue line that you see uh, with the double-headed arrows, that's the space in which policies are today being, uh, being debated. Uh, we have on the right markets with the, the motives of material incentives, uh, outcomes implemented by prices and competition, and on the left, uh, the motivation has to do with compliance with state authority, and the elections are 
implemented by fiat and, and by elections. Uh, and of course, you can place some policy along that line. So the line is the state space of policies and uh, institutions. What we think is that we need to enlarge the state space by adding another vertex. We call it civil society. Uh, motives there include altruism, fairness, sustainability, identity. Also includes in-group favoritism. That is, we don't, we're not proposing civil society as a good antidote to markets and governments because many of the aspects of it can be quite repugnant as well. Uh, now, uh, we think of the alternatives as finding various points within this simplex, uh, each point being some combination of markets, governments, and civil society, such that the three are complementary rather than uh, being competing. And here are some examples. Uh, kidney exchange is a wonderful example, the, the, the kidney exchange in the, in the US. Uh, kidney sales are prohibited, uh, uh, but it relies heavily on the altruism of the kidney donor uh, to provide the supply of kidneys. And the, there are other examples there of combinations of civil society, markets, and government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. If you can stop the screen share. Great. And we'll move straight on to Zoe. Thanks so much. I'm just getting my screen up. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sam and Wendy, for inviting me to participate in this panel with Philippe. You three are some of my um, intellectual heroes, so it's a real honor to be in conversation with you. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in the economics department at Harvard, and my PhD focuses on microeconomic theory. So for the last few years, I've been very focused on the models side of values, models, policies, and narratives. Um, and today I'll be picking up largely where Sam left off in some sense. I want to, um, I, I really love this framework that Sam and Wendy have come up with. And what I want to do is to illustrate the usefulness of this framework by using it to navigate through a discussion about one particular way that corporate governance, that is firm decision-making might change in a new paradigm. Um, so in other words, I want to use this framework to try to connect some dots. What are the policies, models, and narratives around corporate governance in a paradigm based around voice and democratized market interactions? Um, so I think in some sense, I'll, I'll be starting with this, a value that Sam talked about at length, although he didn't exactly use the term, um, the term appears in their paper, um, I would say that a big component of this, this new paradigm being described is something like economic democracy. And so now, you know, going back to what the prior uh, neoliberal way of thinking about things left out is, the, um, is that through framing economic interactions in a morality free zone, the term economic democracy sort of was an oxymoron. Because in some sense, there's you know no there's nothing to democratize when we're in this um, morality-free zone. So one sort of response to this is, well, how how do we think about giving voice to various stakeholders in economic decision making? Um, so my definition of economic democracy is is something like shifting decision making power in firms away from managers and shareholders and toward stakeholders such as workers, consumers, suppliers, and communities more broadly. Um, so naturally, given that this is sort of a question of control and authority and decision-making, it seems like corporate governance, that is the, the set of, of tools that we use to govern the firm, seems like it must be a key piece of an economic democracy based paradigm. But how do we really think about what 
so, sorts of corporate governance policies um, most neatly fit into this paradigm. Um, I, I think today people talk a lot um, with a lot of romance about the idea of uh, worker or consumer cooperatives that would be a totally new way of organizing um, business. We have, you know, there are many countries around the world where there's some form of formal co-determination like in Germany and France and Japan where workers have seats on the board and can, um, can participate in firm decision making. But what, what I see in a lot of the discussion today is a set of values based around economic democracy that are in search of a sort of integrated set of models, policies, and narratives around corporate governance. And it's useful to, to go to sort of, as Sam set up for us, to go to the kind of neoliberal perspective and to see how neatly that perspective um, came up with a way of talking about corporate governance. So we've talked about the values and models that, that underlie this way of thinking and specifically the corporate governance policies that are implied by this way of thinking are on the one hand shareholder primacy, that is the only duty, um, the only formal duty of, a, of the firm is to its shareholders. And we have policies like competition policies. So regulators who are tasked with, um, ta tasked with ensuring that there is enough competition in a given market and identifying abuses uh, or instances of market power and correcting them through either structural remedies like breakups um, in antitrust or through kind of behavioral remedies um, of another kind. And the last thing I'll say about the, the prior paradigm is, you know, the narrative is so simple here. The vernacular for thinking about you know, what corporate governance is supposed to do is so simple. You know, 50 years ago, Milton Friedman said the social purpose of business is to increase profit. And that is so easy to remember <laughs> and um, a, a useful way of integrating all of these different um, levels. And I want to say that this is not, um, this is not totally a, a, an abstract sort of academic um, attempt to come up with a connection between the dots of these values and policies. I'm sure many people here are aware of the 2019 statement by the Business Roundtable, where this group of business leaders moved away from the shareholder primacy paradigm, at least in, you know, at least in their vernacular, to say, we want to say that the purpose of the firm is to um, create value for its stakeholders. And now this, you know, not much has happened since 2019 as a result of this document, but people are certainly talking. And if, even if we want to be cynical about, you know, wh whether the business leaders really had intentions to change their policies, it's still a big, a big move to see this you know, grasping toward a new way of thinking about the social purpose of business. Um, so to, to summarize where, where we are now, I think, you know, there's a set of values around economic democracy and what that means for corporate governance really requires filling in these different levels that Sam and Wendy talk about. Um, I want to interject with a really brief story that won't, won't take up too much time, which is inspired and and sort of retold in this uh, in this paper about the that sort of lays out one particular antitrust case against Facebook. There's a really unusual moment in Facebook's history around 2008 and 2009 when Facebook had its first or one of its very early privacy scandals. Um, and at the time, Facebook was still in a competitive market. It had competitors like MySpace and so forth. And one thing that Facebook did 
in order to regain the trust of its user base after a major privacy scandal and in order to sort of stay competitive in a competitive market was to affirm a commitment to privacy. Um, this was a statement in February 2009 by um, Mark Zuckerberg, which accompanied a major policy change in which the company actually decided to create a set of a system for user referenda where users could vote on changes to the terms of use in the privacy policy. And that vote would be binding. So here, Mark Zuckerberg is describing what, um, what prompted this change. He says, people share more information. A new relationship is created by internet companies. Um, companies like us need to develop new models of governance. Of course, we hear a lot of people talking about these things now. This is 2009, and this is not because of pressure from the government. This was because of pressure from competition. This was because of pressure from MySpace and a desire to you know, take, con take control of this market. So they set up these procedures. They set up direct voting where you know, they said, we'll set up, uh, we'll put our uh, changes to the terms of use to a vote and the results of the vote will be made binding. They also um, set up a user council that would have, again, not just you know, an advisory role, but actually a, um, a kind of formal and a formal authority in the decision-making process of the firm. Um, and you know, lots of people said, discussed ways in which this was a major move. And of course, we know what the epilogue to this story sounds like. Um, essentially, what happened was Facebook was no longer subject to competitive pressures. Uh, they vanquished their um, competition. And of course, they just did away with this user referendum process. And what I want to think about here is what, the reason why I spent um, some precious time t telling that story is because I think it has an interesting, it points to an interesting lesson for us and an interesting sort of model for thinking about what role demo uh, democratic processes could play in a firm. And in some sense, democratic processes can be a sort of remedy for market power. And that's the idea that I'm, I'm going to explain in the last minute that I have here. Um, when we have firms that are, you know, based our natural monopolies, their production processes have increasing returns to scale, where the real issues are about platform economics, which don't fit neatly into um, prior economic paradigms. We, we see that competition policy and shareholder primacy just isn't a solution to the um, abuses of, of, of monopolistic power in a lot of settings. Um, so the, the, the particular policy that I'll explain now and then conclude is to say, well, what if we think about changes to corporate governance and stakeholder governance specifically as a kind of remedy to market power. And so what this would look like, you know, being very abstract at this point, but the idea here would be when an abusive market power is discovered by a regulator, the answer, the best answer might not be break them up or, you know, subject them to some behavioral remedy, but rather oversee some kinds of democratic processes of control and create enforcement around democratizing the decision-making of the firm. And this could take forms that look a lot like co-determination with users and, and workers and suppliers, um, but it could also take other forms. Um, and so I'll conclude there because I think I'm out of time, but. I'll just to bring back 
Sam and Wendy's pictures, I think this is one particular way in which, you know, we start from this government and market um, line and all we can see really is competition policy or antitrust as we typically think about it. But once we start to um, pull off of that line and think about civil society solutions, we can see that actually stakeholder governance in some sense may be a kind of solution to certain forms of market power. And I'll close there. Looking forward to a discussion. Thanks very much, Zoe. That was uh, fascinating. Um, yeah, terrific. So now, Philippe, uh, so we, we move from The Economist uh, to the highly economically informed philosopher. So over to you, Philippe. Thank you. Philosopher's privilege. I don't have slides. Uh, so, and I'm <coughs> like Zoe, I'm uh, <coughs> going to try and uh, illustrate uh, um, uh, Sam's and uh, Wendy's main claim, central claim, uh, and at the same time provide support for it. And I shall do so. One by uh, indicating briefly how I think of the economy, the model, if uh, you want to call it that. Next, uh, the way I think of distributive justice, the values or the ethical values, uh, if you want to call that them, uh, that so. And then uh, by indicating how the pursuit of these values can contribute to the performance of the economy. So how I see the economy, I see the economy as a, an enormous machine of uh, distribution of rents or of gifts. Uh, what the best way to motivate uh, that uh, picture or, of that model of the economy, but is for, at least for when speaking to economists it by starting uh, with uh, efficiency wage uh, theories of involuntary unemployment. As you know, there are several versions of that. There is uh, what you could call the hard Hobbesian uh, approach uh, illustrated in Sam's work uh, or in Stiglitz's work that says, well, uh, workers get paid more than the market clearing wage in order to scale them into uh, producing well. Uh, you have the softer, the milder uh, motion, uh, Marcel Mohr's view, uh, as developed by uh, Ekeloff. Uh, that says no, uh, uh, workers get more than the market clearing wage in order to <clears throat> sort of uh, create this feeling of identification of gratitude towards the firm so that they will uh, give this, uh, provide this counter gift to the firm in the form of uh, effective work. So what this shows is that even if you have perfectly competitive conditions and even if you have equally talented workers, um, you will have employment rents unequally distributed between people. Of course, this both the volume of these rents, of these gifts, and the uh, inequality in the distribution of these rents uh, will be massively uh, increased. Uh, one, uh, if uh, you have unequally uh, talented people, uh, two, if uh, you take uh, into account an equal access to education uh, and to uh, information. Three, if you uh, take uh, into account the, the fact that some workers are far better protected also by collective action than others, for all these reasons, uh, our economy is a massive, uh, but very uh, unequal uh, distribution of uh, gifts and um, uh, in, in the form of rents. And of course, what I just said applies to uh, labor income, but it applies, uh, if anything, even more to other forms of market reward. Then that's the model. What about values? Well, values put very simply consists in distributing these gifts in a fair way. What does that mean? It, mean, it means equalizing this, these gifts as much as is not counterproductive. So, this lead to some sort of notion of maximum uh, distribution of uh, gifts. And the uh, simplest way of uh, implementing that, of giving that a sort of concrete interpretation is in the form of the highest sustainable unconditional basic income. Now, it has to be interpreted in a, in a broad way, uh, in the sense that this should not only refer to cash, 
unconditional income. It can also take the form of uh, in-kind provisions of uh, uh, free, good quality, universal education, of uh, <coughs> free, good quality healthcare, of uh, uh, freely accessible, good quality public spaces, etc. And so, uh, the, this idea of maximizing gifts leads to the idea of the highest sustainable uh, unconditional income in uh, this sense. Now, uh, this uh, idea um, so can be then very immediately closely associated to the idea of freedom, or at least of real freedom. Unconditionality here, although it may not need to be given, take the form of cash, but unconditionality means strictly individual, which means that you, if you leave the household, if you join in the other household, you uh, retain uh, this uh, unconditional income. It means universal in the sense that it's combinable with income from uh, any other source. So no uh, poverty trap, it uh, creates a sort of a more real freedom to say yes uh, to jobs, even if they don't pay enough uh, for you to uh, live on. And it uh, also means a third feature, obligation free, which means that there is no work test. Uh, so if you give up a job, which you regard as uh, lousy, uh, you still retain the right to this uh, income. If you refuse a job that's uh, available, you, uh, you, you are entitled uh, to it. So for that reason, so you can also uh, very plausibly say that in fact, what you do by maximizing these unconditional basic income in a sustainable way, what you do is uh, pursue an ideal of real freedom for all, understood as uh, the greatest sustainable real freedom for those with least of it. Now, um, for me, it is it's one of my been my one of my fights uh, in this life again. The, the day before yesterday in Aix, uh, in Aix-en-Provence, where I was in a panel with uh, Benoit Hamon, who was the candidate for the Social uh, Party in France at the last uh, presidential election and uh, proposed a, a basic income. Uh, one of my battles consists in saying, please, the left should not leave the ideal of freedom to the right. Uh, the freedom is a left-wing idea, but of course it must not be the formal freedom, which was mentioned in connection with the neoliberal model, uh, but it must be real freedom that is real freedom that is the uh, real capacity uh, to uh, act and to pursue uh, one's conception of uh, the good life, not the sheer right to do so. And of course it must be real freedom for all, so that means uh, to uh, uh, have institutions that uh, provide the greatest uh, sustainable uh, real freedom to those with uh, least of it. Um, then that's my ideal and the way, I mean, rough outline, huh? so not focusing exclusively on cash, but in rough outline, how I see the best institution way of pursuing it, then how can this, the pursuit of this ideal, then contribute to the performance of the economy as um, I see it, as I understand it. And I'll here, so by way of finishing my presentation, just mention in pretty uh, telegraphic uh, uh, format, five distinct ways in which uh, this, uh, the pursuit of these values of uh, and the attempt to give the greatest real freedom to all in this way uh, can contribute, can be expected to contribute to uh, the performance of the economy. Now, to put it briefly, real freedom is a productive force, and but it can take very different uh, forms, and several of them have been um, already alluded to, both in Sam's presentation and Zoe's presentation. First of all, real freedom, I said it earlier, is the freedom to say yes and to say no, but of course not to the same job. So that means that uh, uh, the, the presence of this unconditional income gives uh, the power to the workers or potential workers to discriminate between good jobs and bad jobs. And in particular, between jobs that provide a lot of training and jobs that are unpromising because they provide no training. It's very difficult 
through administrative rules to differentiate between these two types of jobs because so much depends on the personalities of the people involved and the relationships between them. And so what a basic income does, an un unconditional obligation free basic income does, is give the power to the people who are best informed. No one knows best, better than the people themselves whether the job is worth taking in particular because of the human capital it provides. That's number one. Two, uh, a basic income means uh, the president, when there is a basic income in place, uh, there is also a, a systematic facilitation of the back and forth between employment, training or education in the broader sense and uh, unpaid activities, voluntary activities within the household, but also uh, beyond it. This will of course mean that we can boost in this way lifelong learning, preferably blended learning, using all the potential of uh, the uh, internet, providing the whole of the educational system is uh, of post uh, ob obligatory education is revolutionized in order to uh, adapt to uh, these policies, to enable people to work longer because they'll be able to avoid, to avoid more easily a burnout or to uh, recycle themselves, uh, redirect themselves at uh, uh, the right time. And it will also enable people to look after the younger generation uh, in a flexible way when that younger generation needs uh, more of it. That's number two. Number three, uh, society, uh, like any organization, public or, or private, has uh, must constantly try to give each of its members an activity that uh, that person likes doing and that that person does well and of course, these two things often go together. One likes what one does well, and one does well what one likes. And at the same time, an activity that is useful to the organization as a whole or to society as a whole. And a basic income is a way of systematically helping a society uh, to do that, to allocate to each person uh, uh, an activity that satisfies these criteria that enables people more easily to create or join cooperatives, for example, or to start up, uh, uh, to start some, uh, some partnership or, or, to, or to simply to follow their, their calling, uh, uh, their vocation. That's number three. Then number four, which is in a way a particular uh, aspect of that, it says uh, because of the basic security it provides, it is a systematic help for the, the lower end of uh, innovators. And so as uh, Mark Zuckerberg just referred to once said in his uh, uh, talk at the commencement ceremony in, at Harvard, when he, uh, he uh, indicated why he thought it was important to think about a basic income, universal basic income, he said, as a cushion to try new ideas. Uh, five, uh, the, as shown, especially in the recent Finnish experiment uh, in Finland, a basic income because of its unconditionality, even if its level is not higher than uh, the social assistance scheme, uh, basic income is also a way of reducing stress and thereby liberating the minds of the most vulnerable people in order to be more productive rather than just try to think all the time, be obsessed by uh, the conditions which they have to fulfill in order to get an access to an income. And then finally, and in a way, most fundamentally, and that's the, the narrative aspect, which uh, is also in the title of uh, this session, we need a mobilizing utopia. And if in these circumstances in which we can expect our freedoms to be further limited by the threat of pandemics, by all that will need to be done in order to, private, to, to prevent dramatic uh, uh, climate change, well, we need a utopia and a utopia of freedom. Yes, it is possible to make people more really free, especially of course those with least real freedom, despite all these threats. And it is possible because the values we want to defend are also, in a sense, uh, productive. They are also contribute, uh, con contributions to the performance of our economy. This was my illustration of the claim, modest illustration of the claim made by uh, Sam and by Wendy in their introductory paper. Thank you, Philip. That was uh, extremely stimulating. Um, so uh, 
Yes, I think this is a. Um, we've had lots of ideas that have that have been thrown up, um, and and uh, a, a, a very rich uh, canvas um, on, uh, to explore in in the, the minutes that we've got left. Um, it, it is a very uh, unusual one for economists to be um, stepping out onto. So uh, uh, I think people are, are still trying to formulate their questions. Um, uh, there's one question in the chat that I, I, I would like to take up, and it, it touches on um, the, the simplex that Sam introduced. Um, and I'll just read the question from Hidsal Jamil. As we understand, the relationship between government and companies in developing countries is, is often, often quite, quite close. close. Meanwhile, the position of civil society, so think, think of the, uh, the, the, the simplex. Meanwhile, the position of civil society at the bottom there is quite weak. Um, based on these conditions, what are your recommendations for developing countries to replicate economic democracy? So, yeah, this is uh, the, the, the model that, uh, that Sam was setting out really stressed the complementarity of these three poles, the, uh, the market, the state, and, and civil society, and their complementary capacity to provide solutions to the, um, the problems that, that are being thrown at us by the really existing economy. So what happens when one of those poles is, is very weak or perhaps is dominated by the um, the 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 uh, the dimension that Sam also mentioned, which is the the insider outsider uh, element of community. I mean, after all, cl classical liberalism moved away from, in a way, from that pole uh, to to uh, to provide um, more equal dignity across all people. So, um, if we if we're going to bring back uh, community, we have to face these issues of weakness. And also uh, of, of of questions of um, identity. You know, the mafia, for example, is a great um, constituent of the community poll. So I wonder, Sam, did you want to add to add add, add to that? <clears throat> yes. Thanks. Thanks very much for your question. Um, uh, if if you if you think about the behavioral norms. Uh, and values that people have, uh, th these are not notably weaker uh, in terms of uh, reciprocity, altruism, cooperativeness, and so on. Uh, that is, behavioral experiments done throughout the world suggest that the values upon which an economic democracy can be based uh, are really very common throughout the world. Uh, so there's 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 nothing wrong with people that uh, uh, it's that the opportunities I mean there's some institutional things that are lacking. Now it may seem strange, but one of the one of the great gifts of the nation state is that it taught people who were not really on speaking terms to consider each other to be um, friends uh, or people with whom they would wish to express solidarity. I mean think about. Um, uh, Italy, for example, which did, I mean, it, Italians existed, but Italy didn't exist. And Italians had very little sense of identity with each other prior to uh, the, the middle of the 19th century. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, when, when, I when I think of the world today, I'm wondering if we couldn't create on a global scale the kinds of identification uh, that the national state did very improbably across France, across the United States, and so on. Uh, uh, I think the, one of the things that's a correlate of strong commitments to sharing and reciprocity in the behavioral experiments is that countries in which the rule of law has been in place for a very long period of time tend to be uh, uh, countries in which people score particularly high on these social preferences. Um, and uh, I mean, that's not a policy prescription, but it is an observation that um, when pe you know, people say, well, why is it true that you get really very strong community kinds of values in, say, Boston or Copenhagen and so on, and less so in Istanbul, for example, or, or Delhi? Um, uh, 
you know, people, some people say, well, uh, it, it must be that market society is somehow fostering these values because market society has been uh, has longer roots uh, in the places that I just mentioned. I think it may well be that uh, one of the accomplishments of classical liberalism, namely the rule of law, is more nearly the causal uh, basis of that. And that does suggest something which we need to think clearly about, which is establishing some rules of the game that people can count on, commonly called um, uh, the rule of law. And th that may be one of the missing elements in some, in some nations. Wendy, if um, uh, because you Sorry. mentioned that, <clears throat> because you mentioned that uh, our discussion is going beyond people's comfort zone, um, uh, I, I I have a very um, a comforting uh, observation to make. Um, probably every economist has heard the statement by Adam Smith: "It's not from the benevolence of the brewer, the butcher, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own uh, self-interest." Uh, I'm, I'm reading from my own uh, undergraduate copy of The Wealth of Nations, when I'd underlined that, um, but I didn't underline the next sentence. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but that passage is usually introduced as a part of the discussion of the invisible hand. We think that Adam Smith is there telling us what a great thing the market is and how, how good self-interest is. No. Um, the next sentence says, Nobody but a beggar chooses to depend chiefly upon the benevolence of his fellow citizens. What? Adam Smith's tale about the brewer and the baker is, is about equal dignity. It's not about efficiency. It's not about a well-working market economy. He's saying through exchanges, we can have some kind of equality. Um, and of course, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, there are a lot of questions could be raised about whether that really works or not. But just to just to bring Adam Smith on board with our project, he cared deeply about equal dignity, and he indeed saw the market as one of the ways to achieve that. Uh, we're not so sure we have, uh, but um, anyway, these ideas have been around for a long time. There's nothing particularly new in these issues we're raising today, at least not if we go back to Adam Smith. Great. So, Philippe or Zoe, do you want to chip in here or should we move on? Zoe? No? Okay, fine. Uh, good. Uh, so, let me, because um, uh, we're, we're sort of running out of time. So, I think it's good to, to go to this question in the chat, which actually touches on all three presentations. Let me just um, read what it says. Um, my question is the following. Do, so, this is from Ahmed Sada. Does the order VMPN, this is like going to be the, the, um, the uh, abbreviation of the future, does the order VMPN matter? If that's the case, and since democracy is central to this paradigm, wouldn't it be more appropriate to have values, narratives, models, policies, instead of narratives at the end? Let the narrative dictate policies instead of artificially dictating narratives through policies. Or is the very goal of this paradigm to create narratives which we deem appropriate to our values? Okay, so I, I, I want to kind of take this one first to Philippe and then to Zoe, because Philippe ended up by talking about um, utopia. And, uh, and I, I kind of want to put you a bit on the spot, Philippe, which is, um, do, you know, is do we need a narrative of utopia? And this, you know, relates to the question, I think, if it was, VN, um, or is is what we're really all talking about here not utop utopian at all, but actually dictated by the the problems that we face that can't be solved without some combination of a new um, VP VMPN, if you see what I mean. So you know that's trying to. I, I think if you could just sort of respond to that, uh, respond to the, the question in the chat, but sort of keeping in mind um, that you have to defend your claim that, that we need a utopian um, okay. narrative. Okay, I shall do the, so very briefly because uh, one, the, the term narrative, I'm not too keen on, that's why I prefer the term utopia, but uh, there is nonetheless not something important in narrative, which is narrative is partly about the past, partly about the present, 
and uh, as a way of uh, shedding light on, on the future. And I think we need that also when we formulate our utopia. So my utopia uh, that of uh, real freedom can be put also in the form of a narrative by saying, look, what's the next step after universal suffrage, which, which is a little bit of political power to everyone. Uh, well, the next step is uh, a universal income, which is a little bit unconditional, which is just as universal suffrage is unconditional, which is a little bit of economic power, not only purchasing power, bargaining power for everyone. Or you can put it, form it, uh, put it in a narrative by saying, well, what was the abolition of slavery? It was it consists in giving formal freedom to everyone. It was a very important step in the history of mankind. And the next step in that direction is giving real freedom uh, to all. Of course, real freedom, unlike formal freedom, is a gradient. It's a matter you can be more or less real freedom, really free, depending on how much you have available unconditionally. Now, how does that relate to then the problems we face? Well, I think we need to be utopians, and utopians means not just dreaming about the future, but really formulating a sort of uh, blueprint, uh, not too detailed, but detailed enough uh, institutional uh, blueprint of the future, and then get it discussed critically, interdisciplinary, uh, so with uh, with economists, but with philosophers, but also with sociologists, with lawyers, etc., to think together about uh, possible perverse effects. So that's uh, the vision which we need, the utopia. And at the same time, we need to be opportunists. That is, given this vision, well, the, there are a number of problems that at some point become very salient. Some of these problems really cannot be solved at all, even a little bit by uh, that particular part of our utopia, but this utopia doesn't consist in a single idea. And then we need to, at the same time, to, to, to solve these problems in a way, um, the problems that are relevant to this utopia, at the same time in a way that brings us closer to uh, this ideal of a better society, but also solves some uh, immediate uh, immediate problem. So we, we need to be realistic utopias. It must be a sustainable utopia and at the same time opportunistic uh, utop uh, utopians that uh, then use these uh, challenges in order uh, to move forward. Chloe, you have the I last word in, in the, in the Very panel. briefly. Yeah, I think this is a great question, um, and it's one that I spent some time thinking about myself. Um, and I think, at least in the context of the presentation I gave, there is a way in which values and narratives sort of come together and present themselves together in, in a lot of ways. You know, I, I talked about the, the business roundtable as one, you know, one particular document that, that captures a certain way of talking about stakeholder capitalism that I see um, emerging right now, at least in corporate America. Um, you know, last year in, in America, corporations, many corporations sort of flooded, flooded our feeds by with messages of um, solidarity about the protests, for example, that were happening last year. You know, Microsoft recently made commitments to ha having 30 some X percent of their uh, um, executives and managers come from certain um, ethnicities and backgrounds and, you know, have also made commitments to sustainability. And what I see there is actually a lot of corporate America, corporate America, you know, really leaning into a set of narratives about the purpose of the firm um, and yet not yet having a set of policies and models for lining up that, that might line up with these emergent values and narratives about what about what the firm is so I completely agree that it could be flipped around and you know to me the model part is creating a systematic way of understanding the problems to which a particular policy might be an answer. And all of the, you know, the model then comes out of trying to grapple with values and narratives. And you know, hopefully the policy can, can emerge from um, some model, which is a systematic way of thinking about 
uh, the problem to which a policy may be a solution. Yeah. Okay. I think that's that's uh, that's a very good way of putting it. And in some ways, you might want to add on to the beginning of these four uh, levels. How have we organize them? The problem, which is all the problems, which I guess is what uh, I was um, uh, getting at, that, that Philippe responded to. Um, so we're, we're at the end of our time, but um, there's a lot of work to do. So uh, I hope that we've inspired you to join us in this uh, in 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 this construction activity. Um, uh, and just some small things that we learned from the pandemic. I mean, the difference between a furlough scheme, which was keeping people in their jobs and paying 80% of their income, as in the UK, versus a, um, a big jump in income that people got in the US, which is a bit like an unconditional, an experiment in an unconditional basic income. And uh, it seems that it has empowered some people to actually really wonder whether they want to go back to the same kind of job that they had before. So, you know, we really have a lot to learn from um, our current situation. And maybe we're beginning to develop a framework that's going to help us to put the pieces together and, uh, and move it forward um, in, in policy. So, and with a good story. So let me thank um, uh, uh, Philippe, Zoe, Sam for great contributions um, and to the organizers for setting up the session. Uh, and I think we, we, have to, we have to finish the session here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy.